Bill prefers order and control over chaos and interruptions. He's been a Christian for years, but he still fights the temptation to be impatient with his children when their needs disrupt his life. Margaret finds solace in a strong drink. She stays sober for weeks and then suddenly gives in to the temptation to drink all weekend. Luke struggles with pornography. He is single and travels for work. When he is alone on a business trip, he sometimes watches sexually explicit shows on the hotel pay-per-view channels. Elizabeth is a hard worker. Everyone in the office knows this. But they also know that several years ago, she almost lost her marriage because of her work habits. She's tried to balance work and home, but she still fights the temptation to achieve and to be recognized for those achievements. Can you, I wonder, identify with any of these people? Bill, Margaret, Luke, Elizabeth, these aren't real people. Uh, but of course, what's described here are very real situations. And though each uh, of these four people are very different, they're, they're motivated, they're, they're driven by different things, what unites them, though, is that each of them struggles with temptation. Now, I just asked you if you can identify with them, but I, I know the answer already. You can. Uh, because you, like me, are a sinner who is part of a fallen world, and you, like me, are a fallen human being. And therefore, every one of us in this room knows the battle that temptation presents. I mean, how many times have you tried to change a behavior or an attitude only to find yourself doing the exact same thing once again? Oscar Wilde once wrote, I can resist anything but temptation. How true it is. So consider, do any of these phrases sound familiar to you? There I go again. Or I've had this struggle for years and I just can't seem to win. Or, I, I do okay for a while, but then I, I get caught in the same old sin. Friends, I can tell you from a, a pastoral perspective that there's nothing more heartbreaking for me as a pastor than to sit across from someone and hear the words, I just don't know how it happened. I didn't think I was capable of. I can't believe I did. And in the midst of the battle in which we get knocked about and become bewildered, we may wonder if there's any real hope. How do we make sense of temptation? Where does it come from? Why does it seem to hold such a sway over my life at times? And is there any way to win this battle? Friends, these are vitally important questions for us as Christians. Okay, these, these aren't things that are relevant only to other people, and they're not things that are relevant only in the abstract. They are, they are vitally important for you, and they're vitally important for me, and they, they are important to our everyday lives. And so we seek answers to them this morning as we continue on in our study of the New Testament letter of James. Let me encourage you to uh, have this passage open in front of you. Uh, it's there in your bulletins on page 10. Uh, there are also some Bibles in the, in the pews if you want to look uh, in the Bible and turn there. Uh, if you're not used to uh, using a Bible, the big numbers that you see in the Bible, those are the chapter numbers, the, the little numbers that you see, those are the verse numbers. I'll be referring to a number of different verses today as we look at James chapter 1, verses 13 through 18. Now, last week in our study of James, we thought about how it is that we face trials. Okay, those, those difficulties of life, those challenges that they, they come to us and they test our faith. Uh, that was the focus of verses 2 to 12 that we looked at last week. But this week, we now turn our attention to how it is that we face temptations in our lives. And of course, in one sense, trials and temptations are very much linked together. Uh, there's a connection here as James uh, transitions from trials to temptations. In fact, it's in the midst of a trial that we often face temptation. You know, the temptation to perhaps to disobey God or, or blame God or to rely on something else other than God. And so James uh, transitions now from giving us the, the tools we need to count it all joy when we meet trials of various kinds 
Right? That's what we, we, we looked at last week in, in, in verse 2. Count it all joy when you meet trials of various kinds. And James gave us some tools for how we do that. Well, today, he's giving us the tools we need to fight temptation in our lives. Let me just show you uh, here how this passage is structured. Uh, in verses 13 to 15, uh, James emphasizes what it is that God doesn't give. And thus, out of that, he shows us the source and the outcome of evil, an outcome in which death is born, he says. But then, in verses 17 to 18, James does the opposite. Uh, he emphasizes what it is that God does give. And thus, out of that, he shows us the source and the outcome of good, an outcome in which life is born, says James. And then at the center of this passage is verse 16. Verse 16, do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Uh, that verse is, is really the fulcrum or the, uh, the pivot point of this passage. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. And friends, that's why James writes this passage. He writes to instruct and, and to encourage and to forewarn us so that we might not be deceived in this battle against temptation. Okay, so two points for us this morning. Do not be deceived about the source and outcome of evil, and do not be deceived about the source and outcome of good. And friends, no matter how great the temptation battle may be for you, even right now, I pray that the Lord will equip us this morning to live lives more and more to His honor and glory. Because as we'll see here today, God is good. Number one, and we'll spend the majority of our time looking at this first point. Number one, when you face temptation, do not be deceived about the source and outcome of evil. And notice just how emphatic James is as he begins there in verse 13. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. Now, just to make sure we're all on the same page, what do we mean by, by temptation? Well, temptation is simply that which is an, an enticement to sin and evil. It's an enticement to sin and evil. And evil is that which is contrary to God's will and, and to God's law. It's that which runs in, in counter motion to what God has revealed in His will, in His word, and in His law. Now, one of the challenges for us in, in thinking about these things this morning, uh, and in fact, if you're here this morning and you're, you're, you're not a Christian, one of the challenges may be uh, to even, even think in these terms of good and evil. I mean, after all, many in our culture today wonder if good and evil aren't merely social constructs, you know, put in place to, to simply help society run more smoothly. And perhaps they're nothing more than that, some people think. And so what you're going to need to do is to, uh, if you're going to understand any of this, is you have to make s to, to make sense of these categories of good and evil. And you have to understand that, that the Bible actually conceives of, of good and evil not as social constructs that we as human beings have arbitrarily put in place, but that these categories are actually defined in relation to who God is. Right? We know what good and evil is because, because the standard is God. And, and likewise, the idea of sin then is, is it's to go against God. It's to break God's law. It's to, it's to do that which is evil. And so, so temptation is the enticement to do just that. It's the enticement to, to go against God. And so what James is saying here is that God tempts no one because God has nothing to do with evil. That God himself can't be tempted with evil because he's thoroughly good and, and, and true and pure and holy. And so evil can't find any hold uh, on which to grab, grab hold of God. There's no place for evil to get a hold of. And so likewise, God doesn't tempt others. Because if God could tempt us to evil, he would then have within him a delight in or a a capacity to evil that simply isn't true of him. And thus he doesn't tempt us in, in any way. And so no one, no one should ever say that God is the one who's behind my temptations. Friends, have you ever said that? 
Have you ever maybe just thought it? Don't go there, says James. It's not God. Now, to be clear, God does test us. He tests us. Again, this is what we looked at last week. God sovereignly ordains trials in our lives to test our faith. Okay, so what exactly is the difference between a trial and a temptation? Well, as, as I was wrestling with that this week, um, I was looking at an old Bible that I used to use when I was a teenager. And I, and I wrote a note in this Bible from years ago. I, I didn't write down who said it. I assume someone else said it. But here's what I wrote years ago in my old Bibles. Temptation is to be dragged away and enticed for evil. Testing is to be dragged away and enticed for good. Okay? Temptation is to be dragged away and enticed for evil. Testing is to be dragged away and enticed for good. The dragged away is building off the NIV translation of this passage. Now, as I look at that, I'm not sure if I'd phrase it exactly like that today. But what I wrote down there as a teenager is, I think, correct. God tests his people. He puts them through trials in order to do them good. I think of Abraham in Genesis 22. Uh, or the Israelites over and over again in the wilderness. God was, God was testing them in order to strengthen their faith and to ultimately bless them by teaching them perseverance and endurance and by showing himself ultimately faithful to all of his promises. In fact, remember the, the verse that immediately precedes our passage today, verse 12. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love Him. You see, God intends to do us good through our trials. He's, he's enticing us to good. He's strengthening our faith. He's, he's proving His people. But again, what often happens in the midst of a trial is that, is that temptation arises, which, which isn't from God. And what the temptation does is it, is it, it takes that trial and it turns it into occasion, an occasion not for relying on and, and trusting in God and thus benefiting from the trial, but it turns it into an occasion to sinfully reject God and to sinfully reject trusting Him and to reject relying on Him and to reject obeying Him. And so you can see that much will depend on the way we respond. You know, which way will we go in the midst of a trial when temptation arises? But James's point here is emphatic that temptation is not from God. So if it's not from God, where does the temptation to evil come from? Well, look at verse 14. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by what? By his own desire. Friends, it's our, it's, it's our own desires that lead us into temptation. And the kind of desire that's referred to here is a, a desire that's against God's will. Okay? It's, a, it's a longing for something that God has prohibited. So it's, it's not that all desire is bad. Uh, there are very good desires we can have that can honor God. But of course, the reality is, is that in a fallen world, even those good desires we have can so often and so easily be twisted for evil. Yeah, so, the, so the desire for food, for example, can easily be twisted towards gluttony. Uh, or the desire for the enjoyment of sexual fulfillment within biblical marriage can be, can be easily twisted to all kinds of, of sexual activity outside of marriage. Which is why, more often than not, when the Bible talks about desires, it often has in mind evil desires. Uh, because our desires so easily become twisted and, and disordered in our lives. And, and that's certainly the idea here. It's, it's through our own evil desires, those desires which are contrary to God, those longings which are contrary to His will, it's through those desires that we're tempted to sin. And they come from us. They arise within our own hearts, dear friends. There are things that you want and feel and long for, and they are wrong. There are things that I want and long and feel for, and they are wrong. And this is exactly what Jesus meant 
in Mark chapter 7 when he said that it's from within. Out of the heart of a man come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within. As you see, the root of our sin is our heart. That's where sin begins. Specific sins are created by our wrong desires. It was great to hear this morning from Angela. Uh, grateful for her honesty. Uh, grateful for the way that God has so generously and kindly worked in her life. I think testimonies like that can be just a huge help for us as a church. I just remind one another of the goodness of God, of the way that He, he so sovereignly gives us His mercy. Uh, let me share with you another testimony uh, this morning. This is written by a woman uh, who's like many of us. Uh, she's trying to live as a Christian uh, in this world, and yet, like us, she, she struggles with innate desires that tempt her and lead her into sin. Uh, now, as I read this, it occurs to me that her example may seem a bit innocuous to you, but of course, no sin is innocuous, so I hope you don't see it that way. Uh, this, this, this woman works as a, a project management team assistant, and she, she shares here some of the temptations that she faces at work due to her own disordered desires. She writes this, I am not an executive with a voice, but an assistant with a list. My day is not driven by meetings, but by tasks. At my company, I am a project management team assistant, which means I help the 11 members of my team with whatever they need, from booking flights to scheduling meetings to organizing PowerPoint slides. One day, my team leader stopped by my desk to confirm that I had made her lunch reservation. Although she had given me advance notice of more than a week, I had not yet done it. With over 100 things on my to-do list, I had forgotten, and I had no excuse. In that moment, I realized that I had two choices. If I told the truth, I would have to admit that I had made a mistake, and even though it would probably not cost me my job, I knew her confidence in me would decrease. If I lied, she would likely never know, since I was fairly certain that I could still get her a reservation. Lying seemed less risky. Yes, I replied, summoning the courage to continue. The reservation is for two at 1 p.m. under your name. She said thanks. As she walked away, I frantically picked up the phone, called the restaurant, and got the reservation. She never found out. No harm, no foul, I thought. I would love to rationalize my white lie by saying it was harmless, but I can't. Those two seconds of hesitation revealed to me how much I craved the good opinion of others more than the good opinion of God. In itself, wanting to serve my boss with excellence was a good desire, but the fact that I felt compelled to lie showed me that I treasured her trust and approval more than God's joy and acceptance. I also wish I could say that I immediately realized that my desires were disordered, but I didn't. In fact, similar situations continue to occur. With each lie that worked, I gained greater confidence that lying was the right decision, no matter how much over time those lies would harden my conscience to the pinprick of the Spirit. As I have come to see the extent of my brokenness and the expansiveness of God's grace, He has shown me that the real fight is not in my choices, but in my desires. My choices are the fruit. My desires are the root. Although I will never be completely free from sin in this age, God is rightly ordering my desires to love Him with my whole heart so that I might experience true freedom and joy. Well, that's, that's what James is teaching here. These desires that are opposed to the will of God, they, they are the root of our sin. And so the source of the temptations we experience actually comes from within. And it's due to our own sinful hearts. Now, why does James tell us this? Why does he make this point? Well, friends, he does so because part of what we do as sinful human beings is, is we blame God and we blame others for our sin. As someone has said, to err is human, to blame it on the divine is even more human. And it's what we do. And if you're a parent... You understand this well, I think. I mean, if your children are anything like my children, then they may very well be perfect like my children are, because according to them, it's always someone else's fault. They have never done anything wrong. 
We blame others, and more often than not, we blame God. Uh, we blame God for making me this way. You know, if He hadn't made me with these passions and desires or with this kind of disposition and, and personality, I wouldn't have done that. It's God's fault. Or we blame God for the, the circumstances of our lives. God, if He hadn't put me in this situation, that I wouldn't have given in to sin. I mean, isn't that exactly what Adam does in the garden when God comes to him? And he says to him, Adam, what have you done? You remember what Adam says? The woman whom you gave to me, God, she gave me the fruit and I ate. Right? Adam blames both God and Eve for his own actions. And so, friends, James tells us this so that we can locate the source of the problem. It's not in our circumstances, and it's most definitely not in God. It is within it's in our own heart, it's our own disordered desires that are the issue when we face temptation. So yes, you, you, know, you, you may need to change your circumstances. That can be a very wise thing to do when temptation presents itself. But even more than that, you need to ask God to change your heart. Okay, that's the source. And you and I need to know that if we're going to have any hope of winning this battle against temptation. Now, there's another reason why James tells us all this in verse 14, and that's so that when we face temptation, we can better understand the process that's unfolding and thereby be better equipped to battle against it. And this is what James is doing in verses 14 and 15. Uh, he, he's not just telling us the source of evil and temptation, but he's also describing the process and the final outcome of it. I mean, it's almost like James is putting the process of temptation that we experience underneath the microscope. You know, so that we can, we can then see it up close and its, it's different parts and, and examine how it is that it operates and, and where it's going. So look again at what he writes in, in verse 14. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed. Those are two important words. Lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, here comes the next step in the process, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Again, what James is doing there, he's slowing down the process of temptation so that we can better understand what is going on in our lives when temptation hits. And he's putting it under the microscope so that we can examine it and defeat it. So how does temptation work? Well, as we've seen, it begins with our own sinful des desires. And then what those desires do is they lure us, okay, which, which is a, a fishing term. So in other words, they, they bait us. Uh, they make themselves look attractive and, and real and, and delightful when, of course, they're not. You know, just like when you're fishing, you put that lure out in the water, and you're trying to snag that fish using a lure that the fish is attracted to. And of course, for the, the lure to attract the fish in this way, part of what it does is it engages in the work of deception. Right? Again, it, it presents itself as something that's real and as something that we must have when neither of those things are actually true. And friends, our own desires do this to us. They, they lure us through, through attraction and, and deception. And then they entice us. And the idea of, of entice here is something that begins to, to fill our every thought. You know, there's a, there's a power and a, and a pull to the desire that begins to, to just consume us. And friends, at this stage in the process, unless that desire is identified for what it really is, as something that's wrong and opposed to God, and unless it's resisted, then in the language of James, what happens next is that desire conceives. It's kind of a grotesque image. And it gives birth to sin. And so the idea here is that that sinful, disobedient act that you were being tempted to is now born. It's alive in this world. And that's not all. Because unless that, that disobedience and sin is, is then confessed and repented of, it grows and it grows and it grows. And friends, do you see what, what, what sin as James describes it here, in all of its great maturity and in all of its glory looks like. You know, this thing that seems so attractive to you right now, 
It's lured you, it's enticed you, whether it be material greed or some sexual immorality or even just the insatiable desire to be liked by others no matter the cost. Do you see what that attractive sin looks like when it's all grown up? It looks like death. Right? James gives us this grotesque image of, of, of death being born and desire is its grandmother and sin is its mother. Friends, do not miss what James is saying here. He's saying that unchecked desire through to unrepentant disobedience ends in death. That's, that's the cycle of how temptation works in our lives. And if you need an illustration of this, just, just look at that passage from Genesis 3. Right, that first Bible reading. The desire is formed in Eve. The lure is set. The voice comes to deceive. Did God really say that you can't have this? God didn't say that. This isn't true. And then do you remember how it's described when she looks at the tree? When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise. Right, you see, the only thing that should, have been, that should have mattered to Eve at that moment was the Word of God and what it was that God had said to her. But instead of her thoughts being filled with that Word of God and of His kindness and of His goodness and of His, his glory and majesty that he, she and Adam had, had been such a witness to, all she could think of was how good that tree looked. She was deceived, lured, enticed, and as a result, desire conceived. And you know the rest of the story. I mean, doesn't it seem like James is, is providing a commentary on that chapter? And if he's not writing a commentary on that chapter, then he's certainly writing one on 2 Samuel 11 and the way that David sinned with Bathsheba. Uh, again, the, the account of David and, and Bathsheba, I mean, it's this very cycle played out in David's life. Unchecked desire through to unrepentant disobedience leading ultimately to death. And friends, the same cycle will play out in our lives if we let it. Okay, so whatever the temptation is, turn from it. Don't take hold of it. And friends, I'm preaching to myself right now as much as I am preaching to you. Flee from that temptation, that desire uh, that you, you are so attracted to maybe. Understand what James is saying here, that it is dangerous and it can lead to death. No matter how harmless or beautiful it may seem right now, and no matter how much you may think you need it, you do not Flee temptation. Fight against it. James has slowed the whole process down for you and me so that we can do just that. So that as we face temptation, we will not be deceived about the source and outcome of it. And listen, I, I fully recognize that there are some times when it seems like this is, it is so hard to win the battle. Like, even if we understand all of its constituent parts. Even if we understand all those. In fact, you may even find yourself in the throes of sin growing up into death right now. You may feel right now like temptation has won the battle and all that's left now is despair. But friends, do not be deceived on that front either. There, there, there are gospel truths to be applied here. There is a way out and it begins with the source and the outcome of good and with the very character of God Himself. And that's our second point this morning. Number two, and we'll be much briefer here with number two. Number two, do not be deceived about the source and the outcome of good. In other words, don't be deceived about who God is and what He gives. All right, look at verses 17 to 18. Let me read these verses for us again. And as I do so, listen for how it is that the truths that are spoken of here are actually tools for you to help you battle against temptation. Okay, verse, beginning back at verse 16, the, the pivot point of this passage. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. 
Of His own will, He brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of His creatures. Okay, so how do we fight against temptation? Well, we do so by being fully persuaded that God is thoroughly good. And in verse 17, James is emphasizing that the, that the goodness of God never changes. He is good all of the time, and all of the time He is good. Uh, we, of course, in this created world are, are constantly subjected to changing light all around us. You know, the sun rises, it causes shadows to fall this way and that. Because we've just entered into the autumn season. I'm mindful of the, of the decreasing light that's going to be all around us. The, the light of day and night also uh, perpetually change. The moon waxes full, it wanes to a crescent. Light is reflected and refracted differently moment by moment. But friends, it is not so with the goodness of God. With God, there is no variation or shadow due to change. Or as one commentator put it, God's goodness is always at high noon. You know, it's always perfectly bright and pure and clear. And therefore, we believe that God is the source of all good. And every good and perfect gift comes from Him. And friends, that's true of you even if you're not a Christian. Every good thing that you have in your life, it is from God, which makes our sin against Him so abhorrent because God has been so good to us. And friends, it's, it's this truth about God's goodness that we need to fix in our hearts and minds so that when temptation comes and we're tempted to forget God like Eve did and to, to be attracted by something else and to think that, that God isn't good and that, and that maybe God doesn't really have my best in mind, it's then, friends, that we need to remember the truth about who God is. He is so good to us. Think of all His gifts. Think of all His blessings. And then to add to that, has He not given us His very Son? Has He not loved us even when we were His enemies? There is nothing better than Him. I do not believe the lie that sin will tell you. God is good and that will never, ever, ever change. And so one way we fight temptation is by being fully persuaded that God is thoroughly good and will be forever thoroughly good. And I think as a church, I mean, this is one of the, this is just one of the, the best and most simple ways that we can help one another, you know, just reminding each other that God is good. Uh, even reading through that psalm responsively, it seems repetitious, but we need the repetition. You know, we need to be reminded. We need to remind each other of the, the steadfast love of God that endures forever, that His goodness is there and it does not change ever. And then a second way James gives us here to fight temptation is by helping us become very certain about what it is that God has done and will do for us. So in verse 17, James has been uh, talking about the good and, and perfect gifts from God. And then it's as if in, in verse 18, he just goes straight to the top of the mountain. He says, okay, let me just make this very clear. The greatest gift that God has given us is what He's done for us in Jesus Christ. All right, verse 18. Of His own will, He brought us forth by the word of truth. Of His own will, He brought us forth. He gave us new birth. He gave us new life. How? By the word of truth. Why? That we should be a kind of first fruits of His creatures. Whereas sin gives birth to death, you see here, a, 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 you see God giving birth to, to life and even the promise of more life to come. Now that word of truth is the, is the gospel message. It's the, it's the good news of Jesus. The message that Christ has lived for us, that He has died in our place, that He has risen from the dead. And through that word of truth, God has given us new life. He's given us new birth. We have been born again. And the reason God did this is simply because He chose to. Of His own will, His own election, He chose to. And so it wasn't because we deserved it. It wasn't because of what we brought to the table. It wasn't if we brought something good. Now, the only thing we brought to the table were our sinful desires, but He chose us because He chose us. Because He's good. 
And the greatest good and loving gift that He's given us is salvation, new life in Jesus Christ. And the goal of this, the outcome of this, is that we're actually first fruits of His creation. In other words, what James is saying is, is that there's, there's more to come. Uh, maybe I think he's saying maybe there's, there's more born-again people yet to come, and there's a whole new creation yet to come, of which God's born-again people are simply the first fruits. And friends, do you see how great a weapon that is in the battle against temptation? Right? One of the greatest weapons we have in this battle is this knowledge about what God has done for us and who we really are. You know, it's not simply the fact that we're forgiven through Jesus and made right with God, which we are wonderfully so, to God be the glory. But it's also the fact that Jesus has given us His Spirit and that the Spirit of God through the Word of truth has regenerated us and given us new life. We've been brought forth as new creations and will one day inhabit a whole new creation in which there will be no more sin or evil or death. And Christian friends, that's who we are. That is who you are in Christ. And so, yes, the presence of sin still remains in our lives. And so, yes, this, this battle we wage against temptation is it, going to be lifelong. And some days, it, it will be more fierce than others. I'm not denying that. But listen, even though the presence of sin still remains, it no longer reigns in our lives in the way it once did. Our sin no longer has the same power over us as it once did. And there are real victories to be had. Which is exactly what God has promised us. In 1 Corinthians 10, the Apostle Paul recounts some of the, the failures that were experienced in the Old Testament. And then he says to the people to whom he's writing, he says, Now these things took place as examples for us, that we might not desire evil as they did. And then he goes on to say, Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. Okay, there's nothing you, you're experiencing that is, that is just unique to you, okay? Paul goes on, God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. What a great promise. That that's God's promise to you, Christian. And God is good, and He does not change, which means His promises do not change. And so here's what you need to do when temptation comes to you. And you're in the midst of the battle, and you feel bewildered and beaten. And you speak to yourself, and you say, Who am I? that I would do that? Who am I that I would do such a thing? I belong to God. God has forgiven me and redeemed me. He's regenerated me. He's given me new life. He has welcomed me into His family. He is my Father. He has a whole new creation that He has promised to give me. Who am I? that I would do such a thing. <clears throat> Friends, God is good. He has given us new life. And He will give us the victory. Amen?